great uh, uh, Nancy family, our organizing team, uh, our uh, uh, nurses uh, who joined us from other institutions. Thank you for joining our team. Nurses, everybody in healthcare, thank you very much for your presence. Thank you very much for joining this event. This is the fifth symposium, uh, which take us uh, this year to go deeper and deeper in looking into the concepts of the results of our care as nurses. What we do, what our doing come well when it comes to the empirical outcome, to the professional practice outcome towards the, the goal of why we exist in nursing. So uh, today we have a distinguished speakers. We have distinguished activities that can elaborate and speak about what we call empirical outcome or professional practice outcome. This is all in line with the journey to excellence. You will hear from me from everywhere where there is serving our clients. I wish you a pleasant and a great momentum in this coming hours tonight and tomorrow, inshallah, in our hospital, Dr. Suleiman Fahim. Thank you very much again, and thank you for the organizing committee for your great uh, 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 activities and great uh, uh, conference ahead. Enjoy, and let's go to the next uh, uh, phase of our presentations. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that very warm welcome. Despite his busy schedule, he was able to join us today to give us a message. The Director of Business Development Department, let's all welcome Mr. Solomon Fee. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala nabiyyina wa habibina Muhammad. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم. Distinguished guests, uh, I'll speak in English uh, because uh, most of the people here, uh, maybe some don't speak Arabic. And I had uh, this speech uh, uh, written, but I think it's better to improvise. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a great honor for me being here with you. It's my honor actually to be here uh, with you in this uh, event. I first want to thank uh, Mr. Ahmed Hausawi for his great efforts in uh, uh, what he did with Ilm and uh, the great uh, accomplishment that not just makes us proud, but I think makes the whole kingdom proud. So I'd like to thank uh, Mr. Ahmed for uh, his support and thank all the nurses who were, uh, who were working uh, during this tough time. And, and uh, I'd also like to say uh, something about the nurses. Uh, the nurses are the pillar of the hospital. I think they're the most important uh, element in the hospital and they're uh, key to the uh, patient satisfaction. Uh, the main reason of uh, the outcomes that happen to any patient is the uh, nurses, whether positive or negative. So, because they're the ones who are staying with the patients at night and providing them uh, the care when they need it most. So I'd like to thank all nurses for their long hours, their uh, compassion, their care, and uh, uh, keep up the fantastic work. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Madam Sandra. Thank you, Mr. Ahmed. Thank you, everybody, actually, 
working in Faqih. I came here not to open the conference because you have, uh, mashallah, my colleagues, they did their best, and you have a uh, yani distinguished people. I came here to send a message. And Suleiman Faqih, when I came 2009, I joined Suleiman Faqih Hospital. I was surprised by the effort, by enthusiasm, and the activities of the nurses, actually. So when I came, I found there is a team. I couldn't find, actually, uh, I mean, any deficiency with the services. And I found that also when I was a patient two years ago when I did my surgery, I thought, what those kind of angel? So I think, I think, yeah, my colleagues in nursing department, they deserve, they have a lot of activity, we have a lot of collaborations together. Uh, they are do doing a great job. Uh, nothing to say except that uh, good luck. And uh, this is the kind of scientific meeting and conference that uh, Faqih is looking for. Uh, again, welcome uh, to uh, the, the Suleiman Faqih conference, and I hope that uh, all the best, my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Saleh. We have seen your support to every nursing activities, and we thank you for that. To talk about the leadership mindset for translating empirical outcomes into clinical nursing practice, one of our special guests for today, for this afternoon, let's all welcome Consultant Advisor of Health Academy, Saudi Commission for Health Specialists, Professor Mustafa M. Goodwin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon to everybody. How are you? With those two messages, you have to be fine. Because I think that the best was already said. So, um, Your Excellency Dr. Mazen uh, Faki, I know he's in Shargia, but he is in our hearts. Uh, Mr. Suleiman Faki, Dr. Saleh Al Harbi. Uh, Chief Nursing Officer, uh, Mr. Ahmed Hassawi, and my very good colleague, uh, Dr. Kathy Sienko, OBE, uh, the Chief uh, at uh, Tokhasasi here in Jeddah. Uh, we, we seem to always meet at conferences, don't we? <laughs> um, it is indeed a, a privilege and a pleasure to be back. Uh, I was last here on the 6th of December, 2017. And I spoke to you about evidence-based practice at the front line. Uh, show of hands of who was here at that time. Let me just see, get an idea. Don't worry, I'm not repeating it. <laughs> OK. Oh, I see at the back as well, yes. So uh, I did, had to do a bit of homework uh, before I came. And I saw your amazing journal and what you are doing. I looked at the Faki website. Um, and I also uh, um, had a chat with uh, uh, Mr. Ahmed during the week to find out the profile of the staff. And I am hoping that what I share with you, uh, and take note, share with you, uh, is something that's going to speak to you and to really get you going uh, on your journey uh, towards magnet uh, recognition. And the topic taken is the leadership mindset for translating empirical outcomes into clinical nursing practice. When we say leadership mindset, for now just pause and just keep that in mind. I'm going to come back to that in the end. Where I'm really going to focus on is the translation and the context and when we say context, we're talking about the setting and the environment in which you practice. The empirical outcomes, I will, I'm going to leave it. And of course, Dr. Cathy is going to speak about uh, the journey to excellence. Um, and, and for now, what I will be doing is being able to just get us to pause and see how far have we come on the pandemic journey. And truly, what I would like to say to you from my heart, thank you nurses 
for being there at the bedside for the patients throughout COVID-19. I think you need a round of applause. And Dr. Uh, Mr. Suleiman, uh, really, um, I don't know, was it your marketing line? I don't think so, because I saw ikhlas. There was sincerity when you said it, that nurses are always there. Dr. Saleh said that in his experience. And when we look at all the healthcare professionals, everybody comes to the patient for an episode of care, except nursing. Because nursing is with the patient 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 and a quarter days every year, right? Because we have a leap year. So we can't forget that quarter because the nurse is always there. And as uh, Mr. Suleiman said, you are the pillars of Fakih care. Let that sink in. Because if you don't have the pillar, the institution will fall down. Just take that in for a moment. So I speak to you as one nurse to another. I'm proud to be a nurse. I've enjoyed being a nurse. And I know I'm now going to date myself for 42 years. And I've enjoyed every moment of it. I have no regrets. And I will keep on going on in nursing because nursing is where the pulse is in healthcare. Nursing makes the difference in the lives of people. So in my presentation, I'm going to cover Kupal, the context of the organization, education, practice, and then I'll bring it together as leadership at the end. Now I'm going to move sometimes quite fast, and I did give to Ms. Basant, there is a PDF because some of the content all uh, right, uh, so uh, it will be shared with you, but just sit back, relax. I'm going to be a bit like the airlines, you know, they say, in the unlikely event of there being a decrease in the cabin pressure, the oxygen masks will automatically fall down in front of you. Please make sure you attach it to yourself before you help the person next to you. So if I may ask, try to resist leaning to someone next to you to chat about what is being said. Just focus on the oxygen mask for yourself and later on you'll get to someone next to you. Because when you disturb the person next to you, you may interrupt their process of taking in what is being shared. Okay? Deal? Game kanaba? Game na? Right? What is the reality of our context? And this I have to own as an educator. We go into the classroom, as we can see there, and we tend to oversimplify what happens in healthcare. We say it's a journey from point A to point B. And when you see in this diagram, when you leave that classroom and you go outside, it's not a straightforward journey. And therefore, it becomes important to look at context. The context in which you are practicing, the context in which you are functioning as a nurse. Whether you are working in the outpatients department, whether you're working in the OR, whether you're working in hemodialysis, whether you're working in the critical care. No pathway in nursing is straightforward because the patient themselves is a complex being. Before I go any further, I just want you just to, for a moment, just close your eyes. Don't worry, we are not going to take anything from you. Just close your eyes. And if you don't mind, please put your mobile on silent. If you can just do that, because I don't want you to be embarrassed when it rings. And then can you take your other mobile, because most of you have two. And put that one also. <laughs> <laughs> on silent. Busted, right? <laughs> okay. Have you got a, a hand mic, please? I can just use that for a moment. 
And I want you, I want you just for a moment to close your eyes. Close your eyes and picture the patient in the bed. And you can probably see the patient. Okay, open your eyes. Ladies and gentlemen, that patient can be your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, could be you, it could be your child. Now in society, why we call ourselves a profession, it's because there is unspoken trust that society gives you. When you say I'm an RN, I'm an MD, I'm a registered pharmacist, they give you this trust of two hands. And the least we can do is to honor that trust. And regardless of your nationality, regardless of your religion, regardless of your speciality, it becomes important to be able to just pause, like you do time out, and you take everything for time out, take the heart out for a moment and just pause and ask yourself this question. Whenever you're feeling tired, you're feeling weary, and you think, hmm, not going to renew my contract, it's time to go home. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. Just pause next to the patient's bedside and say to yourself, if this was my mother, my father, my brother, my sister, what would I want for them? And then like the Nike advert says, just do it. <laughs> right? Just do it. Get it done. And that is the most important component for us to be able to um, for us to be able to know what is going on as far as, uh, thanks, can I give you the mic? Sandra. Madam? Sandra. Madam Sandra. Hello. <laughs> that is the most important, and you keep that in mind as I go through the contexts. The first is organization, and you may think it's got everything to do with the CEO or the president. No, no, no. Let's have a look at it. It's got everything to do with the entire context of leadership. Strategy, people, partnerships and resources, processes, products and services. Put in another way, ladies and gentlemen, that's the magnet journey. <laughs> that's the magnet journey saying, Salaamu Alaikum, hello, how are you? This is what you have to look at as far as the magnet journey is concerned when you start. Because if you look at the magnet journey in detail, you will find that all these components, as mentioned by the European Foundation of Quality Management, that is the context within which you are practicing at your level at the front line. There are three things that come up here in terms of characteristics for organizational uh, enablers. Firstly, flexibility, secondly, stability, and thirdly, alignment. FSA, flexibility, stability, and alignment. And these are very interesting because flexibility is the mental capacity to adjust to the changing demands and requirement. And don't, don't, don't our patients change condition? So sometimes you start a shift and the patient is okay, and then suddenly during the shift the hemodynamics of the patient changes, and you, they, therefore you have to change your approach. Or you have to transfer the patient into the ICU, or you have to uh, uh, call a team in because the patient needs attention. It also happens in terms of organization, the structural and process flexibility of transformation, because the magnet journey is a journey of transformation. Number two, stability. So there is always, and I, uh, as, as a, a nurse that loved uh, endocrinology, like the pancreas, 
secretes a basal metabolic rate of insulin and then every time we eat we have a spurt of insulin right that's the same with stability we cannot function to be flexible unless we have stability and the stability gives us constancy and permanence and that's what our routine is about it's the precursor for flexibility you cannot have flexibility if you don't have stability so if something is going crazy on your unit if something is going wild on your unit look to see what are your fundamentals we call it basic nursing care that's the stability and then do the flexibility which is your your different type like perhaps doing the uh, um, the neuro observations of the patient and the dual existence of stability and flexibility in transformation is where you have the fundamentals together and it's when you've got that together that you can actually redesign and your project for portfolios then you can actually start your unit based committees in uh, the magnet journey and finally alignment alignment go onto the Faki website and look you have an amazing website go and see what is the mission vision values go and see what is the st strategic plans and how you connect to that because the third one is alignment and you need to synergize your ideas your thoughts your strategies for the agreed common purpose of transformation and then of course you focus at the unit level so you may have the high level up there but it, it comes right down to where you are the next point is to develop organizational agility. Agility is the ability for mobility. So agility embraces flexibility, stability and alignment where you are adapting to the pace of change. Nothing since COVID-19, nothing is slow anymore. With COVID-19, we stepped almost 15 years ahead in terms of e-learning, 15 years ahead in terms of digital learning, uh, 15 years ahead in terms of what we do these days uh, in terms of conferences, in terms of bringing expertise to Saudi Arabia. They're just there on, online. We just zoom in or you, or you go onto Teams. Learning to adapt quickly to prevent chaos and prevent sustained uncertainty. If there's uncertainty on your unit and you're the charge nurse bring your team together do a quick huddle part of reliability do a quick huddle and stabilize your unit and then move on for the rest of your 12-hour shift <clears throat> and remember that it's part of co-creating it's not just you telling the others when we get to leadership we're going to see that and so part of this is self-leadership your agility if you've made a mistake as a leader, to actually put up your hands and you say I think I've made a mistake those are the leaders that I respect context setting what is happening here we've got patients 50% of the unit of the patients are actually very sick 50% of the patients or you find that by the end of the shift 75 percent of the patients because some of the patients have changed condition stakeholder agility remember that you are part of the business of a key care and then of course the creative uh, agility is to take that into mind and then deliver and and just do it there are four criteria to focus on if you don't want to spend time trying out something sally shaw uh, her original work and I wrote with uh, Dr. Fadi Munshi we wrote an article about these four R E I S race in German it means uh, race means uh, journey race are relevance what you're doing is it relevant if it's irrelevant don't continue because then it has no purpose is it going to be effective or ineffective is it going to have impact and if you get to R E and I and it's going to have impact then you need to look at sustainability because it cannot be a once-off you must be able to continue to keep it going in education this is somebody I'm going to introduce to you too is Jane Hart Jane Hart talks about the ways people learn and how education takes place in the modern workplace 
And she's done 15 years of research in the UK. She's the founder, uh, founder of the Center for Learning and Performance Technology, C4LPT, one of the le world's leading websites. And take this website because you can go onto it at any time and you'll find it's very dynamic. She keeps changing it. And she's got work with Oracle, uh, the healthy option Oracle 2. Jane Hart uh, speaks about four ways in which people learn. They learn firstly by didactics, which is the straightforward, you sit in the classroom and the teacher teaches in the traditional way. Number two, doing. So that's what you are doing on the unit and that's very much Kolb's work uh, by experiential learning. Discovery, where you discover something and you think, how does this machine work? And then someone, come, someone comes to show you. And when they show you once, you never forget because then you do it straight away yourself or your competency. And discourse, it's the interacting and, and speaking to people and, and now that we have social media. But let me show you some of the percentages of how people learn in the modern workplace that's going to surprise you. So there we see on the right, didactics. This is from 15 years of research by Jane Hart. Didactics only accounts for 12%. If you are doing the typical presentation with PowerPoint on the unit, you are only stimulating the staff 12%. What you really need to do is look at doing. There must be an activity linked to your education, which is 29%. That's almost 30%. And then you must look at discovery. There must be a way in which people do uh, uh, events or activities that they discover the next step, like problem solving, like reflection. And then finally, discourse, which is 20%. So we need to shift our focus by not getting stuck on just the usual presentation where someone stands with a piece of paper. And that's why I said Ms. Basanta has uh, this uh, presentation, because you really need to look at it, because the learning takes place better by doing, discovery, and discourse. And take note of the percentages there. And of course, when we look at this in the modern workplace, you've actually got uh, learning and development on the left, we've got managers and we've got individuals. And what is amazing is that these four Ds cut across all the areas. So whether you're in the classroom, whether you are at the bedside, whether you are doing a handover, whether you're doing report, uh, whether you are, are actually taking a course or some in-service, the didactics, the doing, the discourse and the discovery cuts across it all. And of course, here we have the modern workplace in the post-COVID period. So there's the person, uh, personal productivity tools, there's enterprise and collaboration, which Fakike has much of, of that, there's the virtual meeting platform, there's the web, there's the online, and of course there is now we have the LMS, the learning platform. And these are the methods that are being used. Try to get away from the stiff classroom uh, uh, talk and chalk method that we've had from the past. And the reason why Jane Hart actually motivates this, as you can see from the right uh, going in a clockwise, is this automation. And as we have automation and advanced technology, artificial intelligence and machine learning, you have to read tomorrow morning's publication on artificial intelligence to actually understand what's happening today, because it's a cutting edge. And right here in Jeddah, you have the, one of the world's leading experts, Professor uh, Wadi Al-Halabi from King Abdulaziz University. He's done work with nursing. He's done work in the OR with looking at machine learning and artificial intelligence. And he spoke to my PhD class just two nights ago, and their minds were blown. They, they began to see nursing in a different level five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. He, uh, Jane Hart also speaks about the post-COVID workplace. There are no longer such a thing as a job for life. Because if you're going to take, oh, this is my job for life, then you're going to get stuck. You, <laughs> you're not going to move on. And even if you, you're saying this is my job for life, you can enrich that job. You can move to different aspects of that job using the magnet uh, recognition pathway, using your unit-based committees. There's lots for you to do. And finally, there's the information explosion and decay that's happening all across the world. I just want to remind you of those percentages because they changed my life. 
I actually don't do lecturing at all. I'm a lecturer at uh, King Saud University. I teach PhD nursing students every Monday from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. I never do lecturing at all. I use doing, discourse, and discovery as the method of learning. And they don't even take notes anymore because they live the experience and they can explain the experience. It becomes a journey and they are totally connected to it. So keep those in mind and go to modern workplace learning. Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, like Mr. Suleiman, um, I have a marketing component and I don't have any shares in this company. So I just want to declare that ethically, okay? Uh, I just, I'm crazy about Jane Hart's work, uh, ways people learn in the modern workplace. Now let's get on to what we do, practice in nursing. We often talk about responsibility and accountability, and that can be very boring, right? Responsibility, accountability, the ability to respond, the ability to be accountable. That's kind of version one and version two. So let's do version three today. Let's update. You see, if you don't have commitment in your formula, your responsibility and your accountability is dead. Let me prove it to you. So in 2015, when the National Guard had the MERS outbreak in Riyadh, I had a group of my Saudi nurse interns, all female, and they came and they said to me, why are they excluding us from the hospital? They told us, no, we are Saudi. We need to go home to our families. And they said, this is our country. This is our people. This is our hospital. And therefore, we want to be involved. And of course, as a qualitative researcher, I thought, focus group. <laughs> so I did two focus groups. And what I'm about to present to you is how they unpacked, because what these young new graduates were saying is that we are not going to accept the fact that we are being excluded from taking care of MERS. We are part of the solution. And that's the new generation of Saudi nurses coming up. And I see some of them sitting here in the audience. Mashallah. And so when we get to the next level, I put this together. That commitment is vital. So I put together, yes, responsibility plus commitment gives you accountability. So responsibility is your job description. And accountability is you answering that you did it or you did not do it. But the unspoken part often is the commitment. And so therefore, if you have responsibility, but zero commitment, then your accountability is going to be very shaky. If you have responsibility and zero commitment, I can hardly see you being a leader. Because part of being a leader is being committed to your responsibility so you deliver as far as accountability is concerned. And you know this famous one at the bottom that says, nobody knew that everybody was not going to do it. Everyone was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it. In the end, nobody did it because everyone was looking at each other. Let's unpack what our Saudi nurses gave to me because I put it together using my qualitative skills. So they said, levels of commitment. First, we have commitment to oneself as a health practitioner. And that's made up of my personal values and professional values, my belief system, my ethics, and it's me. That's why they were saying, why are we not at the bedside with MERS? We are not scared. The, uh, one of them actually said, okay, if you don't want me in the hospital, then I'm going to go and take care of the camels. Because <laughs> remember that time we were talking about MERS coming from the camels. Number two, your commitment to the patients and their families. That's where we started. Knowledge, skill, and values, and your cultural responsiveness. So, ladies and gentlemen, some of you 
Of course, we are very happy to have you. We have the national nurses, which is our Saudi nurses, and then we have our international nurses. So when you go to the ATM and you put in your card, after payday, and then you punch in, other amount, and the money comes out, Ooh, now I can go shopping, all right? And when you look at the real, it's in English and Arabic, and it's got the kings, and it says Saudi real. So ladies and gentlemen, if you are earning Saudi reals, does it not make sense therefore that you should be committed to the Saudi vision 2030. Don't let anyone tell you you're not part of it. You are part of Saudi vision 2030. You are part of the solution. You should know what the three pillars are of the Saudi vision. If I ask you now what they are, I won't embarrass you. You should be able to tell me what they are. Vibrant society. Right? Thriving economy. Right? Ambitious nation. We must know that. You cannot work in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia if you don't know the vision of the country because you are part of the solution. And how do you realize that in your commitment is to the patients and their family because you have cultural respons responsiveness and the needs of the patient. Then you have commitment to your nursing colleagues so that you have effective communication for handover, respectful behavior, team environment and trust. And so that you know that you, are, you can depend on someone else. Because tonight, if you're going to turn your patient and you've got a very heavy patient, tomorrow night you may have a, a, a light patient and it's fine, but the next night you're going to have a heavy patient again. You want others to come to you and say, can I give you a hand? Can I work with you? That's what commitment to nursing colleagues is about. Then to the nursing profession. And the nursing profession is by you having a positive reflection to the public, irrespective that you work in Saudi Arabia. You are part of a global community. When you put RN behind your name, it is an exclusive title that we use globally when you say registered nurse. You belong to a global nursing community and be proud to uphold the standards of nursing. Be proud for self-regulation and be proud of the honor that comes with being a nurse. Then your commitment to the interdisciplinary team members, collaborating and cooperating, putting the patient's best interest, because you're not going to take the patient as just the, the fractured femur, or the patient that's got acute abdomen. You are nursing the whole patient. And therefore, you may have to bring in the interdisciplinary team. You may have to bring in the dietitian. You may have to bring in the occupational therapist because this patient is, uh, has suicidal ideation because she's just gone through a divorce. Uh, her family has thrown her out, whatever the reason is. And right now, she, she feels that there is something that she cannot do because she cannot distract herself. Bring in an occupational therapist. They are marvelous. They are wonderful uh, colleagues to have. And they will actually give activities to the patients to occupy them. Team cohesiveness and advocacy, where you're advocating for each other. And not when the doctor has walked out of the room or the pharmacist has walked out of the room and say, well, he's not really a good doctor. A'udhu billah min shaitan al-rajim. La hawla wa la kawati illa billah. You cannot put aspersions and negativity on your colleague when they walk out, even when you know that they are not delivering at the best level. Because that's what being professional is about in your commitment to your interdisciplinary team members. And maybe you will step out of the room and you will go to the doctor or the pharmacist or the physical therapist and say, <laughs> Doctor, thank you so much <laughs> for having come. But that wasn't the reason. She's actually got breakdown on her heels. That's the reason why we asked you as a dermatologist to come and have a look at her. It's not the skin on the body. When you asked her the question, yes, she responded about the fact that she's got a rash, 
But that wasn't the reason. We asked you because she's actually got deep fissures in her heels. Can we go back inside and look at the patient again? Do you see that? With a marvelous little smile on your face. The patient's best interests. Team coercion, uh, cohesiveness and uh, advocacy. Then I like this one. Commitment to safe quality care. And that is part of the organizational responsiveness. Advocacy on, on safety. Do no harm. Zero, working for zero harm. And being truthful, making sure that that error doesn't reach the patient. Being able to explain to the patient what is happening to their bodies because we respect them, because the patient knows best. You know that how, how often as a patient, you give them the tablets, they look at it and they say, Sister, this is not the tablets I take. Oh yes, it is, uh, we, we can be so confident sometimes. And then when we go and we check, we find out the patient is always right. Unless, of course, maybe the color has changed, then we explain. And we, have, we, we owe that right to the patient to go and get the box and show them that, yes, the color is changed because the patient is actually particular about what they're going to put into their mouth. And finally, the level of commitment to the nation's health, to transformation, to maintain accreditation. You are part, as Mr. Suleiman said, you are the pillars of a key care. And it's through you functioning at your optimal that key Care maintains accreditation. So don't forget your role. When you go on your magnet journey, you are part of the solution. And finally, you are part of the health system science. So we are constantly using evidence-based practice, and in this case, empirical outcomes that need to be translated. I'm making my case. I'm almost there. So let's revisit that formula. Responsibility plus increased commitment will give you a check for accountability. And I love the slide that says commitment is an act, not a word. Right? It's not just something we say, I'm committed to whatever you want me to do. No, no, no. Show me. Do it in your action. All right? How often, you know, whenever you want to understand something, then you go to relations, relationships. Remember when someone says, I love you with all of my heart. I will die for you. Don't ask them to die. I, I will die for you. And the moment you run into trouble, dot, 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 dot. All right? It's very important. Sometimes you don't have to have someone saying, I love you, I care for you. Sometimes the nonverbal, just the unspoken, tells you that they are committed. And that's really what accountability is. It's the action. It's being able to complete the round and say, you know, I'm finished my round, but can someone go with me to room seven? Because that patient is not looking great. Don't rely only on your own knowledge, because that's commitment to the patient. Go with them, because it's shared accountability. And the person may go with you, and the person may have experienced more than you, or there's something particular that they notice on the patient, and they are able to say, we now need to take an advanced level of referral for this patient. Now finally, leadership. Yeah, I'm beginning to wrap it up. So I've set the context in terms of organization. I've set the context in terms of education. I've set the context in terms of practice. Now let's wrap it up for leadership. How do we translate this mindset into empirical outcomes and practice? What type of leader are you? Are you the boss? Are you the one that's always sitting and saying, do as I say? Or are you in the front of the team and say, let me show you how it's done. So you lead by example. And this is fantastic. There's a leadership maturity continuum. And I love this by uh, Pishawaria, who says, we need to mature in our leadership. And maybe when you first got promoted, you did feel, oh, this is so nice. Now I'm the boss. No, no, no. 
That's just the beginning level. You need to move on to being the leader. But the best is the third column where you are become the servant leader, where you are steward uh, in terms of your leadership, where you see yourself as serving others. You serving the team. You catching people where they are and you lifting them higher. And that's when you really feel that sense of satisfaction. No money can buy that. You can't put your a price on that. That's priceless when you see someone else beginning to form. So, my dear colleagues, take care of our new graduates, especially our Saudi nurses coming through the system. Be the steward leader. Don't be their boss. Show them how it's done. Transfer the knowledge to them. Sit down and talk to them when they make mistakes. Don't yell at them, because then you're being the boss then you're still on a lower level of maturity because your maturity as a leader needs to then move on on the leadership continuum. Now let me point out what that person at the front line is doing. That person at the front line often gets inundated with high priorities. So the person at the top says these are the 10 most important things that I want you to do. Then it gets to the next level and they say, well, in fact, that there's 10 that the CEO wants, so number one, and you add on five. And then it gets to the next level and they said, well, on the 15, we're going to add on another 10. And then when you get to the front line, the person is bogged down with at least 40 priorities that are going on at that time because they feel, how are they going to cope? And that's where your leadership comes in. Because if you've, got, if you've got the nurse at the front line with 40 priorities, then maybe it's time to cluster them into similar groups. And this is really what I'm going to be sharing in terms of the mindset. Sometimes you see some leaders, and if you are one of them, just sit quietly and just take it in, because you're about to make a change. You find some leaders are busy, 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 busy. They are busy, 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 busy. And you don't know what they are doing. When you look carefully, nothing's happening. There's lots of activity. They're spending a lot of energy. And therefore, we need focus. It becomes very important to have focus. So that our mindset needs to change. And are you, on the left, fixed mindset so that you don't hear... If someone tells you, you say, I know that. Don't tell me what to do. I've been a nurse longer than you. I've been at Faki. And you know how some of, some of them, then they start shaking the whole body. I've been here longer. I know exactly what I'm doing. Yes? If you're laughing, then you know I'm talking the truth. Right? No. You know who are my teachers? My nine PhD students. Because you know what I did? I ran this presentation with my nine PhD uh, candidates, all from Saudi Arabia, from Haile, from Jazan, from Abha. Uh, they fly into Riyadh every Monday. And so since the time when you invited me, I kept on testing the content to make sure. And they said, no, 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 T Prof, take that out. Put this in. Address this. Focus on that. And it's to them that I acknowledge this presentation. They were my teachers. Imagine if I had a fixed mindset. I wouldn't have learned. I wouldn't have been able to deliver. But I came with a growth mindset where I'm open to a new mindset. And when you have a new mindset, you have new results. And then your empirical outcomes, when they translated with a growth mindset, you will have results in key care that is not even in the article that's published. Subhanallah. So there's different types of looking at this. You've got the growth mindset, which is freedom to think. Freedom to act within that accountability. Or it can be limiting. And, and you, you probably have seen this. But I think the most striking one is at the bottom, where you see the tree. You either can continue as a green tree that's constantly being fertilized and growing, or you still have the shape of a leader, but actually you've died inside. And maybe today you were heading in that way and you can catch yourself. Don't slip away. Come back and that's what the purpose of these symposiums are about. is for us to come and get charged again and refocus and know that our mindset 
On the one level, the mind is everything. What you think, you become. So the characteristics of the proper mindset is adapt a growth mindset as opposed to a fixed mindset. Be intellectually open to ideas, experiences and diversity. Persevere in response to critique and obstacles. Assume authority over your learning and develop as a writer. Don't wait for your nurse manager or for the leader or the director to say, where's your professional development plan? No. Arrive at the meeting with your professional development plan, with your goals, because you are leading your mindset, your mindset of growth. And all they're going to do is they're going to enhance that and add to it. I love this quote by Darwin Kinsley. It says, you have powers you never dreamed of. You can do things you never thought you could do. There is no limitations in what you can do except the limitations of your own mind. Fabulous, isn't it? And you know what he was? He was, a, he was a coach. He died in April 2016. And this is what he said. He said to his basketball players, he said, you have powers you never dreamed of. You can do things you never thought you could do. There are no limitations in what you can do except the limitations you place on yourself. So if you've been thinking of studying, if you've been thinking of that course, if you want to do statistics, if you want to do some qualitative work, or there's something in the magnet and you want to do a magnet course, go online. It's all open. There's no boundaries anymore. There's e-learning. There's digital learning. Don't, don't only check to see, oh, well, I have CMEs for it. Don't be CME driven. Do it because it's improving who you are and it's improving the person that's going to render care to the patient. And finally, I want to talk about meaning and purpose. And let's start with purpose. Purpose in Arabic, we say near. It's the intention. It's what's behind the intention. What is your intention for doing what you're doing? And behind that intention, there's a meaning. And Aisha, may Allah bless her, said it's about actions and intentions. And you see, when we look at meaning, meaning means it is important to you. You cannot go and nurse the patient if you don't think the, that what you are doing to the patient is important. You need to know before you go into the room. Sometimes just stop outside the room, recalibrate in your mind and go in and you think, what I'm about to do for this patient is important. It's significant. And that gives meaning. Meaning is linked to purpose because it's the reason, the near, the intention of you doing what you do. And if you get your meaning and your purpose right, for key care will have no problems with impact. Your impact will be fabulous. It will be off the scale. It'll, you won't be able to graph it anymore because the impact will be so powerful. So. Defining your leadership, and this is absolutely 2020, 2021. There's only two authors that have written on this, and this is meaning-based leadership. Finding meaning in your leadership. You are not just doing it randomly. You are doing it because there's meaning in what you are doing. There's purpose in what you're doing. The purpose is underpinning what you are doing. When Dr. Kathy uh, speaks about excellence, behind the excellence is meaning and purpose. Defining leadership and creating your unique purpose. And that's why I've shared the slides because that you can go over yourself and do an inventory in your reflection. Move out of your comfort zone where everything seems to be okay. And if you can move and as you can see the graphic on the right says cut the T away where you say I can't do it. Get rid of that because you can say I can do it and move and you will feel first some fear when you're getting out of your comfort zone and once you get over the fear you start learning and once you get from the learning 
growth begins to happen and then you start having the most fabulous experience where your commitment goes up and your accountability and you'll walk through the corridor with a little bounce in your walk and say I love what I do and the patients are therefore in good hands transformation is often about unlearning then learning because sometimes we've learned bad habits along the way and so our hard drive hasn't got space anymore so sometimes we need to unlearn our routine and things that we're doing and say well we've always done it this way we need to unlearn that so we can learn new ways and I love the next one that says there's no need to be perfect because only Allah is perfect there's no need to be perfect to inspire others let people get inspired by how you deal with your imperfections where you say to the team I don't know this patient I've done the Glasgow coma scale the patient is scoring 14 out of 15 but this patient is not looking well because the Glasgow coma scale cannot pick up certain things and you maybe need to take an experienced nurse maybe you need to call the ICU and let an ICU nurse come and have a look follow that intuitive because intuition is evidence-based and it's part of empirical outcomes so there there's meaning-based uh, leadership Nippenberg I had to practice that Nippenberg and Anya Elfrieda are the two authors and as you can see it's 2020 coming out of organizational psychology because they say all the other leaderships that you talk about transformation leadership authentic leadership uh, servant based leadership whatever those leaderships are it's all embraced in one thing and that's a meaning based leadership and meaning based leadership makes each of your leadership unique and individual because it's meaning for you it's purpose for you it's purpose for that patient that you are involved with so meaning based leadership is the way forward and if you want to get your magnet recognition then that is the meaning uh, and connect to that meaning finally when you look at leadership there are four things that you should be looking at how to inspire people empower people lead change and share the vision there are others you'll always get there uh, as you can see at the bottom people will tell you leadership is about this about that challenge vision energy and then sometimes you cannot remember it but when you think of four things shared vision lead the change the next speaker is going to talk about that inspire people empower people challenges is what makes life interesting overcoming them is what makes life meaningful remember that in nursing you are never an island you are always a team I am because you are and you are because we are that is what is believing in people even more than they believe themselves don't do micromanagement don't delegate something to somebody and then go and check up with them after five ten minutes let them get on with it believe in your team hold them accountable by working on their commitment and their responsibility my take-home message that brings me to the conclusion because I've practiced a few times so I should be on time madam speaker don't wait for the perfect moment take the moment and make it perfect and therefore if you've been a bit shaky about your mindset start going to look up mindset and you will be able to find and I go back to it because I know you want to see it again don't wait for the perfect moment take the moment and make it perfect I thank you thank you sir since 2017 up to now you continue to amaze us with your presentations thank you for that
So for our nurses, what are the key characteristics of an organizational enablers? As Professor Mustafa mentioned, excellent. FSA, flexibility, sustainability, and alignment. At this time, we're going to pause for a while before we proceed to the other, listening to the other keynote speakers for a 10 minute prayer break. Thank you.
I want to talk about our data. I want to talk about our practice. I want to talk about research and education. I want to talk about employee engagement and patient experience. I want to talk about how we integrate technology into what we do every single day. If we do all of that, if we work as a team, if we work with a whole organization and a whole society, we will get magnet. Don't worry about magnet. I'm not saying it's not important. Absolutely to be a magnet hospital is the most marvelous thing. But that is not your purpose in nursing. Your purpose in nursing is every single day your patients are touched by what you do and they leave your hands ten times better than when they came to you. So, Aristotle apparently said this, but I found out recently that he really didn't, right? So that's why I said maybe Aristotle, but I don't think he did. It says, we are what we repeatedly do. So excellence is not an act. What did Professor Broderick say? Right? It's not an act. It is a habit. And the habit becomes, if you know about the development and the psychology behind the development of habits, you will realize that eventually you have developed a habit when it becomes integrated with how you live your life every single day. So you no longer think about it and you no longer stress about it. If you're like me, right, and like many other human beings on this earth, before something becomes a habit, it becomes the thing you desire the most. Think about diets. You cut out meat, suddenly it becomes the thing you desire the most in the world. Until one day you don't, because you've made that lifestyle change and you've made that commitment and now you're driving towards a goal that is really, really important. So that's what I mean when I say that magnet is not necessarily your goal. Magnet is your reward for developing excellent habits in your clinical practice, in your operational work, every single day. So as I said, in relation to habits, eventually it becomes something that you no longer think about. Right? It's just one of those things that you actually do. So whatever those habits are for excellence, there has to be some kind of commitment in terms of how you actually drive for them and how you get there. Except that now you're not developing a habit as an individual, you're trying to develop that excellence habit as an entire team and I dare say it as an entire organization. Because as much as people talk about Magnet as being a nursing thing, it's not really a nursing thing at all. It's driven by nursing practice, but it's a whole organizational thing. And I'll tell you why I think that is. So you've seen some of this before, and this is what I said when I said, I think Prof. Bodrick and I were on totally the same page. So in healthcare, excellence is a verb. It's an active thing. It's what you do all the time. It's not this thing that you describe, it's not an intention, it's set by intention, but it's not just an intention. It is not a hope. You know, I had a colleague from the US that used to say to me when I'd say, I hope, he'd say, Kathy, hope is not a strategy. He's right. Hope is good, right? As a Christian, I know that hope sustains me a lot of times, and you would know that whatever your religious persuasion. But hope is not a strategy. It's a sustaining pillar to get you to where you need to get to. So when we think about what excellence looks like, it's about competence rather than just confidence. So it's good to feel that you're good at what you do, but how do you know that you know? 
And how you know that you know is your competence. And that's measured through things like benchmarking. Because that's when we, be, we stop believing our own hype and we move beyond our own narrative and our own belief into the proof that what we believe is actually true. So when you do your MDNQI data, don't think about it as it's just the data. Think about it as proof that you are competent and that you know that you know. Excellence is also about commitment rather than a one-off. So I heard Professor talking about commitment, right? Commitment takes some tenacity. Healthcare is tough, you know. It really is tough. It's enjoyable, it's fun, but it's tough stuff too. And it takes a lot of commitment in order for you to be able to say that you know that you're excellent. So when I first, I, I used to run a lot of races, I still do. Now we haven't had many road races recently because of COVID. But when I first started running, I would see people who would turn up. Of course, you can see that I'm not the slimmest person in the world. But I would see people who would turn up at the race line and they would be limbering up and they're looking fit and you feel a little bit intimidated, right? And that's what organizations are like too, right? You look at the hospital down the road and you think that their grass is so much greener than yours. Because sometimes we're really good at limbering up and putting on a show. And that's not commitment. So I see people at the race line, they're limbering up and they're all looking fit and they're giving it all that. And then I get one kilometer down the road and that person is just walking it, all right? And I'm jogging through because I'm thinking to myself, you've started so you've got to finish. And that's what commitment is. I don't care if I finish last, but I've got to finish and I've got to finish running. And that's what you need to do in your race to magnet and to excellence. You've got to finish on your feet and you've got to finish running and you've got to finish with pride. So it's not a one-off thing and it's not a fad, it's what you do every day. And it's about being proactive rather than reactive or procrastinating. You know, we'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it tomorrow. We'll do it next year. We'll do it next month. Right? Or we wait for something to happen. We wait for our happy scores to go up. Right? The prevalence goes up and then we take action. We don't think about how we might be able to be proactive about preventing pressure injuries. Because here's the thing, this is all about big picture stuff. It's small picture, big picture. So I always say to people in my organization, I wear two hats. I have my nursing hat to which I'm totally committed, but I also have my bigger organizational hat. And that's about things like capacity, expense, cost, risk, patient experience, bed turnover, right? all of those things that were never in my nursing books. But I know that what we do is the glue that holds organizations together and that helps them to achieve exponential results. So excellence is about several things. It's about being agile. I heard um, Professor Mustafa talking about this. It's about being agile. It's about being on your toes, not anxious, that's a whole other diagnosis. If you have anxiety, that's a diagnosis. So agility is not about anxiety. It's about being on your toes and being ready to make that shift as needs change and as healthcare changes, to think about how do we do this differently? How do we do it better? What's the landscape looking like? And that's your CNO's job sometimes, to kind of think about, okay, what's coming down the road? that maybe you can't see at the bedside, but he sees it, he gets it. And he comes and he says, guys, we've got to do this. And you're like, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to do it? We don't get it. And it's his job to set that vision and to help you understand why you need to be agile. It's also about being urgent. Don't leave for tomorrow what you can do today. I know I sound like my mother. 
because that's what used to happen when we had tasks at home, right? On a Saturday morning, we'd all have our tasks. And sometimes, you know, you try to slack off a little bit, because we were, we were 10 in our family, eight girls. So of course, we always had a task to do. And we'd slack off a little bit. And we'd say, Mom, can I do it tomorrow? And she said, don't leave for tomorrow what you can do today. Or I'd say, Mom, I'm just tired. And she'd I need to rest, I'm just tired. And she would say to us, don't worry about resting. You'll have plenty of time to rest when you're dead. Go and do your work. <laughs> so it's about having this sense of urgency that what we do matters to people in the here and now. A patient who is sick cannot wait for us to do it tomorrow. And if they wait unnecessarily, that's an extra bed day that could have been given to another patient in need. That is income that your organization is not generating, that cannot be reinvested for your development or for you to have wonderful conferences like this. So what you do really, really matters, but it requires urgency. It requires a goal orientation. Why are we doing this and what are we aiming for? And everybody driving behind that goal. And it's qualitative and quantitative. Everything that you do every day holds your organization up. Yes, I know surgeons do activity. I know your OR is your most expensive resource. I know the ICU is next. I know that surgeons bring business into organizations. But here's the thing. The one impression that patients leave with is the nurse that treated them beautifully or badly. It makes or breaks that experience. Research will tell you that patients and the public really have no way of judging the quality of health care. So I came for an operation on my hip. It went well. That's all I know. But here's what makes my experience so terrible. It's the nurse who was rude to me. Because he or she is with me 24-7. The physician is gone. The surgeon is gone, he comes in every day to check my wound, to check that I'm mobilizing, etc. But it's the nurses who help me to the bathroom or they don't. They answer the call bell when I call or they don't. They leave my food on the trolley at the side or they put it in front of me and they ask me, can I help you with that? When I want to go to the bathroom and I ring the bell, they come in a reasonable time so that I don't wet the bed. They wash their hands, and not only do they wash their own hands, but they encourage others strongly to wash their hands, and in fact would prevent anybody from touching me who didn't wash their hands. That's what we do, and we make the experience for the patient, or we break it. So it's those qualitative things, but it's also the quantitative, because what we do builds your business, or it ruins it. I know that sounds really dramatic, but it's true. Because nursing is the largest workforce in any hospital. So if you are excellent, your hospital is excellent. And if you're not, unfortunately, it's the other thing. It's also about being courageous. It's taking on stuff that maybe you didn't think you could do. Think about when somebody says, we want you to start doing X or Y on your unit. So I have a medical surgical unit. In fact, it's mainly a medical unit where we were asked for the nurses to do cardiac monitoring on that unit. They're not cardiac nurses, so what do you think happened? They panicked. How are we going to do this? We've never done it before. What if the patient dies? And that's not a panic that's born out of, we don't want to do it. It's a panic that's born out of safety, right? It's a focus on safety. How are we going to make sure the patient is safe when we have never done this before? So it's the job of the leaders, Dr. Ahmed, the nurse leaders and other leaders, to help you to feel the courage and to acquire the confidence and the competence that you can do this. Because what does it mean? It means that I no longer have to move some patients off of a medical unit because they need cardiac monitoring. We found a way to do it. But it took a bit of courage, some education, some training, some upskilling, and in the end, 
We did it. And now, what do you think's happened? It's just become our norm, right? It's just become the norm of how we do our business. Be bold. Speak your mind. And I don't just mean bold in the form of being courageous to take on new things. I mean there's this sense of boldness that is born out of a desire to do the best you can for your patients and for yourselves. Because the care environment is not just about what you do for your patients, it's also about what you do for you. Think about it. There is a reason why employee engagement is one of the single biggest factors or lack of engagement in success or failure. It's not just about what you do for your patients. If each of us came out every single day committed to do the work for our patients, great, that's 50%. But what happens when you're in an unhappy team? What happens when you don't have great multidisciplinary teamwork? What happens when you don't have equipment and supplies? What happens when you don't feel appreciated and engaged in what's happening in your organization? And these are the benefits that you get in driving for Magnet. Right. It's about being bold enough to speak up for your patients or to say, I'm sorry, Miss Kathy, please go wash your hands and then we go touch that patient. Even on the days when I'm wearing my high heels. All right? And it's also about enjoying what you do. Nursing is a wonderful, wonderful profession. We learn so much and we grow so much and it's about just making sure that we enjoy these moments you know the times when the patients say thank you, the times when patients say funny things, the times when they warm your heart by giving you, you know, bringing you a box of chocolates and saying thank you, you don't know the difference you made to my life. Nursing is enjoyable because you laugh at things that are totally irreverent or you leave from dressing a wound and you go straight to the cafeteria to have your dinner without even thinking about the fact that between dressing that wound and washing your hands, you're now in the canteen eating your food. It's just what we do, right? We just roll with things as, as they happen. So let's talk about the mindset shift. That word, it will be the word of the day, right? The mindset shift. We're going to shift from doing the work. because That's what we're paid to do every day. We do the work. And I don't know any nurse or healthcare professional who wakes up and says, you know what, today I'm going to come to work and I'm just going to do the worst job I could. Everybody comes to work to do their best work. And everybody wants to bring our best selves to our organization because what we do really matters. But we need to shift from just doing the work. And in order to shift from doing the work, we have to have outcomes. We've got to be outcome driven. Why are we doing this and how are we doing it and how do we know that we know? We've got to be transparent. I heard Professor talking about that too. When we make a mistake in saying, oh gosh, that was not my intention. And whether that's a patient mistake or somebody that you offended because that you're all a multinational group here. And sometimes we might say or do things that might rub people up a little bit the wrong way. It's about holding your hands up and saying, I got that wrong. They may be simple things or great things. It doesn't matter. The habit of being transparent is what gets you to that point where you can have those transparent conversations. So one of the things I tend to do with my team is that, you know, I, I'm a night owl. So I feel like my best ideas either come when I'm in the gym or when I'm in my bed when I really should be sleeping but I can't switch off. And so I get to work sometimes in the morning, I'm excited. And I say to the team, guys, I've got something to share with you. And usually it's a half-formed idea, right? But in my head it's a beautiful thing, don't judge me. Right? It's a beautiful thing. And I put that idea out there and somebody has the bravery to say, Miss Kathy, do you think if we did this or that or the other, you think that might be a better idea? And I say to them, okay, try it. Why do I do that? It's not to make myself look stupid. It's because it frees people up to bring ideas to the table and to have others contribute to those ideas and to make it into something that is even more beautiful 
than what I thought it was. And who is that idea for? It's often for our patients and for our staff. It is about making sure that we never lose our focus on the patient. That goes without saying. Ensuring that employees are engaged. Now, if there are any financial people in the room, I want you to hear this. I don't want you to cut anybody's pay or not give them a pay rise next year. Right? But here's what I'm going to say to the nurses here. If you look at surveys around employee engagement, salary is often the fourth or the fifth most important thing to, to people. Don't get me wrong, we all need money. But we need other things as well. Look at any survey on employee engagement, Accenture, EY, McKinsey, or um, Chief Learning Officer, or any other. LinkedIn does a beautiful survey every year. It will tell you that the top four things are these. Am I contributing to a higher good? Do I have purpose? Am I working in a team that is cohesive and that has a growth mindset? Do I have opportunities for growth and development? And then, am I being paid enough? The research goes that if we have all of those other things, then money is still important, but it's not as important as when you don't have all of those other things. Make sense? So please, no salary cuts or anything like that. Money is important. Exemplary leadership. Here is your leader right here, right? These are some of your leaders in your organization. Exemplifying the kind of organization that you want to be and putting that investment in to make sure that it happens. Leading from the front sometimes and sometimes leading from the back, right? So I'm a total operations person. Every job I've ever done is operations. And it's very hard for me to keep my hand out of the day-to-day -day operations and to let my deputy just get on with it. So sometimes I have to have a stern conversation with myself and lead from the back, all right? Facilitate and let him do what he needs to do. It's scary if you're a little bit of a control freak, all right? And it's not about control freakery. It's really about I know that I'm accountable for everything that happens in that organization. But sometimes I have to know that what I've invested in my team, if I'm really confident about what I'm investing, I have to be willing to step back and let them step forwards. The leader is often the person at the back. They're never the me, 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 look what I did, look how wonderful I am, aren't I amazing? Look, if that matters to you, do it in front of your mirror at home, right? But the leader is often the person who is quietly there, just pushing you on, just egging you on, just telling you, we can do it, we can do it, giving you your tools, fighting for you, advocating, and making sure that you have the resources that you need. And these are unseen skills that are operationalized every single day. The leader is often the person who's lying in their bed at 2 o'clock in the morning, thinking about how they get the best results out of you. And these are not things that are seen, right? And whether you're leading at a unit level or you're leading up here, it's that same skill set. The leader holds that vision together. When everybody's falling apart and saying, this is too hard, as my team will in three months' time because we're on our magnet submission on the 1st of April. So I can tell you from January, everybody's going to be, Miss Cathy, this is all hard. We have so much to do. I need help, right? And my job is going to be to hold that vision together. And that's what your CNO has to do, and that's what you each have to do at the bedside. That's what you have to be for your colleagues. So when somebody's falling apart or they're having a hard day, reminding us why we're all here and holding to that vision. Obsessive improvement, just wanting to be better and better and better and better and better. Don't be satisfied with just being on that one spot all the time. So again, and I'm nearly, nearly there, when I first started running, I had a friend who would run the marathon, the London Marathon, every year. And I remember saying to her, I don't know how you do this every year. And she'd be, Kathy, anybody can run. 
And I'd be like, well, anybody but me. And then I would go see the marathon and I would see people, fat people, thin people, old people, young people, disabled people, all running the marathon. So how did I start running? I got on the treadmill and I gave myself five minutes. And by two minutes in, I was about to die. Well, that's what I told myself, right? I was surely about to die. But then I got to three minutes and I realized I didn't actually die. I was still on earth and I was still on the treadmill doing my thing. So then I challenged myself, okay, do four minutes, do five minutes, do seven minutes. Some days I did seven minutes, the next day I went back to the gym, I could only do three. But I stuck with it. And then there was a race, a 10 kilometer race, and I said, that's the thing I'm gonna do. Never run a 10K in my life. That's what I'm gonna do, and I did it. So of course, what did I say I would do? I would do a half a marathon. And then I would do a full marathon. And that's just how it goes, and that's what improvement is like. And the last thing, but not the only thing, is about being change ready. Health care does not stand still. Professor spoke about this. We have seen learning democratized in a way that we never thought was possible. If we had it our way, we would take all the time in the world to bring new technologies to market. We would take all the time in the world to have conferences. We would wait until the world reopened before we had conferences because we couldn't do very much online, right? And now, we have found that it is possible to do just about anything we want to do because we have been change ready. Well, I'll take that back. Now we're change ready. We were not when COVID started. But now we're ready for anything. So if we do all of those things, we go from doing the work to being the change. So if you're on your magnet journey, you've seen this framework. This is the magnet model that is based in empirical outcomes. How do we know that we know? If somebody comes and challenges you, you say we're the best at, how do you know that you know? Jim Collins wrote a book called Good to Great, and he said we cannot be the best at everything in the world. But choose the things you can be best at and really be the best at them. And the other thing he said is, if you're going to be the best, some people have to get off your bus. So if you have people in your team, I'm not asking you to throw them out, <laughs> all right? But if they're not on your bus, on the same journey, You've got to think as a team, what do we want to do about this? And that's a hard ask for nursing in particular. 77% of the nurses in Saudi Arabia are trained overseas. So we are a net importer of nurses. So to get rid of a nurse or any healthcare professional is a very big thing. It's a difficult thing to do. But if your option is to tolerate poor practice, or to get somebody off your bus and be excellent, you might have to get a few people off your bus. So, don't go back to work in two days' time and start looking at who needs to be on the bus. <laughs> Assume your best intent and that you all deserve to be on this bus. But a part of what you have to help your leaders to do is to know who, how to select for excellence as you're hiring into your organization. Because once you hire for excellence, you never need to get anybody off your bus, right? Your bus is always going to be amazing. So you know the magnet framework, empirical outcomes, structural empowerment. Your unit-based councils are more than just something to put in your portfolio. They are there to help sustain your leader and your leadership to run your organization, right? It's part of your shared governance model. So this is more than just about being able to say on your CV or put in your, your portfolio that you're on the UBC. This is about being able to say, I am helping my organization to grow and to achieve. Transformational leadership. So we talked about meaningful leadership. And meaning and transformation 
are consistent. They're synonymous things. Right? They're not direct meanings, but they're synonymous. Transformational means being ready to make the change as and when. It's getting the best out of you. That's a hard job. I have days when I'm not feeling my best, let alone to get the best out of my team. But we don't get to make that choice. Right? As a leader, I don't get to come in today and say, guys, you know what? Don't talk to me today. I'm not feeling at my best. So just shut my door and let me get on with life. I still have to find it from somewhere in here to be able to say, let's do it. Right? So each of you has to be that for somebody else. New knowledge and innovation. I think this is one of the areas that Saudi really has a lot of advantage in that we have a young population who is very tech savvy. And I don't want you to think about innovation purely in terms of technology, right? You hear all these things about you know, artificial intelligence and virtual realities and augmented realities. And I have to tell you that I think in many respects technology is overrated. Okay, I used to be a director for a technology company. I worked for Cerner for five years in Europe. And before I joined Cerner, I can tell you that I knew nothing about technology. Right? I don't know if many of you are not as old as me, but when I bought my first computer, we had MS-DOS as the operating system. And I was doing my first degree, and there was a, a sound that used to come up on the computer when you did something that you shouldn't that would go ping. And that ping terrified me, right? So what, what transformed my life? Learning to undo was the thing that transformed my life. Simple trick in word. I learned how to undo. And when I learned how to undo, I was like, wow. Now I can try anything because I knew that within five or ten moves back in the day, if I made a mistake, I could just undo it. And that's how I became confident with technology. So when I say technology is overrated, I don't mean that the tools and the, the, the opportunities that we have with technology are not important. I'm saying don't let it be the thing that scares you. It has enormous utility in practice for our patients. But innovation doesn't always have to look like technology. It doesn't have to look like the next version of Apple. It can just look like making a change at the bedside. All right? And finally, exemplary professional practice. Doing it well every single day in a highly reliable way. If you get, not if, but when you get your magnet accreditation, you are half the way there to being a high, reliable organization. So just go do it. So in closing, there is a lot to take in and a lot that I think resonates with many of you. But don't wait for the change to happen. It was Mahatma Gandhi who said, be the change you want to see in the world. So when you're tempted to come to work and say, this isn't right, that isn't right, the other isn't right, we don't have, we don't need, we don't... Be the change that you want to see in this world. Be the change you want to see in your practice. Be the change you want to see in your hospital, the change you want to see in your village, in your society, in Jeddah, in Saudi. Be the change for Vision 2030. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you, Dr. Kathy. Um, I believe that everything. so difficult to speak after a great uh, speakers, uh, Professor Mustafa, my mentor, and Dr. Kathy, where I discover now another mentor. <laughs> Thank you very much for your great speech. 
Um, uh, firstly, uh, I, I want to welcome you again. Uh, this presentation is going to be very, 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 very light. Um, I think uh, the discussion being uh, delivered forward it says all about uh, what is excellence is about. We had a, a touch on the, uh, the concepts of uh, a mindset shift, the importance of leadership and the meaningful leadership. Um, but let's a little bit go back and, and look into the story of what happened. I joined Faqih Care in early, actually this was on 19, no, it was 25 of December 2019. I joined and I found the same gathering here with the presence of our president and everybody and I said, well, what am I going to do here? Um, I saw the warmness, I saw the calmness, I saw the engagement and everybody happy and that was awarding day. However, I, the first mission I got from the president before I joined Magnet, my heart beat, is bumping and I said, well, we can do it. So the time when I saw that gathering, I said, yes, we can do it. But as they say, life is what happened to you while you are planning something else. Um, we knock the door of 2020 and we had our consultant, magnet consultant, Gladys. She made a fantastic job for us in, in a deep uh, assessment to look into the capacity and the readiness of magnet and uh, yes, we saw the gap. And the gap was so wide. And I thought, how are we going to cover this gap? My God. Corona at that time was just in China, laying somewhere in one of the tiny village there. And nobody cares. We got media saying COVID is coming. But March 2020, COVID knocked our door. So the entire game changed. And that, what took me to go where, what I will do, whether I will meet the challenge of COVID-19, I will meet the challenge of, I need to debouture on my journey of magnet as the promised, we had a fresh assessment survey with a fresh opportunity of improvement. Oh, we can do better. However, Magnet says no. The challenges exist, but thank God I have great people around here. Please give them a very big round of applause. <laughs> we had a meeting. And I want to use the analogy of Dr. Kathy of Boss and said, hey guys, our boss is going to the butcher. We have COVID just right now here and we have magnet should go around. And we have to support the organization for, for, for going into this challenge because we do have emerging projects. And I'm going to give you the story of this emerging project. So, the um, so we opened the door, but I found really there is no way. That exactly was my momentum when I stand, especially when I got the knowledge that there is no, you know, like the care for you and all this kind of stuff. And I was traveling every day from Mecca, Jeddah, and my colleagues, they were coming, Ahmed, how are we going to go home? We don't have a drivers and so on. It was really bizarre. Do you remember? Ah, uh, here we are now. So what happened then? We said, okay, we can do better. And of course, you know, like we, you know with this stress, stress always what made. Stress bring lots of what we call mind wandering. People, they cannot focus. People, they always, they always go on constant stress. If we see the performance here, and we see the, uh, the, the, the level of stress hormones somewhere there, when we practice with constant stress, normally our performance goes down. So, mafia concentration, mafia performance, mafia ability fatigue and mind wandering people are in vocal words so we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow every day we get new legislation new system new memo and a new way to go ah we don't know where to go however i need to put lots of energy to get people in the midway 
in the flow zoom there is a, a famous professor called M M Mahali Mahali actually he has a lot of work on something called flow the book of flow he met actually he interviewed number of uh, um, athletics and those who are working with high tech uh, um, 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 uh, activities, performance like um, uh, neurology surgeons and so on, ophthalmologists, and he asked him what you're feeling when you are the best of your performance. So they describe their feeling. So they do high performance while they're happy in the moderate uh, feeling of what we call stress. And then that was in mind what, how I'm going to take my entire team will work on this. The problem is my mind was there, but I cannot be in low performance. I got a call from our president, Hausawi, we have a project. I said, okay, <laughs> what's the project? They said, vaccine, P um, um, what they call it, uh, uh, BCR test. I thought that project is just a tiny project. We can have a tent somewhere in, in, in some side of Mecca. And then I said, yes, sir, we'll do it. That was in the afternoon. I was just about having my lunch. I said, yes, we're going to do it. That call end now by serving more than 15 million of our populations with vaccine and BCR. <laughs> this was not this person is speaking, but guys, you, because it was run and led by you, by the team of nurses at Faqih Kir. So thank you very much. We said no. Well, I, I said, hey, now I have this task and, and projects, and so what I'm going to go. So uh, we had, I had before when I, I came back from my study at Harvard, I build this humble model, sorry professor, a very scratch work. So I thought if I'm going to jump, you know Nokia? You know Apple? Anybody here carries Nokia phone? Yes, no, maybe? Of course no. So I said, if I'm going to continue in focusing on that COVID-19 mushkila, if I'm going to focus on what I have with the projects, magnet will never come alight. So therefore, I said, we need to work like Apple fashion. So we need to work on exploitation and exploration. So therefore, what we done with the team, we gathered together and we divided our work. What we need to achieve between March 2020 and today, we have had at that time a plan of going into more than 10 accreditations. <laughs> Surprisingly, it's been done. Thank you. <laughs> so we said, we have this and we need to go through it. And then we said together, we do have our nursing continuous education. We need to go through it. So all the tactics, everything we done, Bixis was just there and pharmacy busy, Mr. Pharmacy team, oh my God, Dr. Abdelaziz and his team and we have that, we need to go. So on that all in the middle of COVID-19, I said, I need to work on that flow. Do you remember the flow? So I need, we need to keep ourselves all together in that flow level. So therefore, we had a lot of focus on what we call culture and healing environment. So we had a chance to go through a uh, reawakening purpose, reflective session, go in that empathy and compassion session and speak with authentic leadership courses and so on, just to keep the, the agility mindset. So where we can go in meeting our goals and continue in what we do for day to day. Um, there is a concept called heliotropic effect. In, in order to improve or to do anything, you need to build an environment. If you have a flower and this flower does not bloom, what you do, you fix the environment of that flower where the flower will, will bloom instead of cutting that flower, isn't it? So we focus, we said, well, we need to focus more on what we call heliotropic effect. Everything exists in this life has a tendency to lean to, to positivity and healing and kindness. So that was our secret in going with the team, in focusing more 
on healings and uh, and and that was a little bit of if you remember shout out do you still have it somewhere yes. are you shouting out every day so we said people they need to express their kindness they need to express their compassion they need to say something about it to each other they need to talk where is Jamaica here oh my god still those arts there so I, I saw how nurses they were able to navigate the challenge of that and bring the heliotropic effect in that particular zoom and, and keep us away from the stresses. We still remember our um, celebrations, even with COVID-19, we were doing all this. This is all to keep the momentum uh, of, of where we can develop in, in the journey to excellence plus meeting the challenges we have. This some of the momentums, if you remember, this, this presentation is all about memory. Okay, so there is no more knowledge, but the knowledge is there with you guys. Uh, so if you, we're still working on that, so we utilize all the means. As uh, Kathy said, yes, with the challenge of COVID, we converted everything online and we've we, we done well. So during that time, those sessions were running uh, for healing and, and cultivating compassion and uh, leadership reflecting. Uh, sessions I um, still remember the team buildings and how we get to to go through our our journey to excellence uh, is not just something that yes um, magnet in a private sector uh, during COVID um, while holding very complex projects so I think I think it's, it's the most important thing is how I can get everybody aligned with the vision and the mission and what we need to do for the organization. Uh, this was challenge, but guys, you make it easy. And I saw this, and we're still seeing it, uh, where the engagement and the workshop we conducted, and everybody break down what is in for them to get that vision met. So it was beautifully when nurses, they decided, we need to align our vision, nursing vision, uh, and mission with faqih care. So they went to the statement and just they changed healthcare to nursing care and they said we're going to do exactly what the organization said. So that took us more to go deeper into putting our uh, strategic goals where we, we define our strategic goals collectively. We'll go with the nursing structure empowerment as, as a major component with all the elements uh, of, of, of journey to excellence and we focus all on operational excellence and enhancing person-centered care approach. And that was more aligned with all the activities. So this is example of the list of the strategic focus alignment with nursing objectives and also we, with, the, with the task for, for the champions from nursing team and also as the professional practice outcome or measurement. I want to quote what the statement Kathy said, how do we know that we are doing excellence? So it's not just we are doing great, but let's have something measured, whether qualitatively or quantitatively. And this is the beauty of having it measured and even cascaded to all levels. And that will go more focusedly with, with certain projects, which has been also uh, uh, listed and, and assigned. Um, I think without having a great team around, uh, those what we call them magnet champions, but I, wa I would call them magnet heroes. Please give them a big round of applause. <laughs> great things in business are never, are never done by person, by one person, they are done by these people. Thank you. And I think, I think magnet champions, their, their inspirations inspired the person speaking. I learned a lot from this journey. And the time when we started the journey during COVID with that pressure and, and face mask and oh my God, and, but you make it. Uh, and you take us to the, to the level where we are now. Thank you very much. So, and, and that's what we saw it. Uh, engagement is really essential to go with the structural empowerment and that's how we aligned the vision, the strategic objectives and everything we do with our, with our shared governance model, with, the, with our educational activities and, and so on. 
uh, and, and that it takes us uh, to go and doing something a little bit unusual. Uh, for, for me in particular, a um, little bit, uh, you know, like a business oriented. So I haven't had a chance to go and play and so on. But I've done a lot of things at Faqih Care. Thank you, Faqih Care Nurses. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I think I think a message I learned I kind of flicked on this um, managing and leading is not about who you are is about how to adapt and engage with the team and go with the with, with the way that can take them to the to the place that they want to be or actually they don't see it yet so that's the ability of transforming this and that's great learning i had faqih care in these two years thank you very much our great team <laughs> this is a slide shows our structurally our our shared governance model uh, where it, where this is built by our nurses i know it's very complex with tiny stuff but we can see how it goes from the from the uh, business units, from 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 departments based, uh, aligned with the with the clinical practice council and that service line, and then it go to the coordinating council in the corporate nursing, and then for our uh, uh, different uh, 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 governing bodies, uh, committees, and so on. Uh, and we had fantastic presentation from our frontliner. Now we have a member in IRB. Staff nurse is a member in IRB. I, I serve I serve IRB almost 14 years. I haven't seen a nurse serving in IRB except here at Faqih Care. So thank you for giving us this opportunity to go for magnet journey. So we can see uh, the representation from the team. And this is just example of the alignment. And this, by the way, built by our staff, by our nurses. And that's, that's the kind of engagement. In the end of the day, what we actually, we build together, that what we can feel. It's our product and we go forward in achieving it. This is just examples of how it's aligned. And this is one of the, uh, the, the momentums of our uh, sessions we done, for instance, for our professional practice model. It was built by, by nurses. And we took about eight months to go for that competition. Eventually, they come with this. They produce beautiful videos, and, uh, and they put their alignments. Uh, we can see here, uh, we go from global health. We, we benchmark with international issues comes from the global and that's what actually impacting our community our the day to day job population management and community health we align with 2040 or 2030 vision where it goes and focusing on community health as well as empowering nursing workforce our person centered care at the middle and the forces of magnet and of course what moving us is the vision and mission and our values that was the conclusion of our nurses that is nurses conclusion and here we go. Uh, this is some of the memory. Anybody here work with us in vaccine center? Oh, oh, I can see hands up. Okay, so this is one of the meetings we had in Riyadh. Before we start the vaccine center, we had in the airport, we had in, Jed in Mecca, we had here in the studio. So we have about five, seven centers actually in the Western provinces. And this is the, the nucleus meeting, the first meeting we had with nurses. Here is Nujud. Nujud is the nurse manager, is the nursing director of ambulatory. Um, we have two of our staff nurses. Uh, we have um, uh, Grishis and the other one, Percival. And we had here another star. Stand up, please. <laughs> Give me a big round of applause. Okay. Muhammad Turki Abdel Qadir is nursing educator. These people who are actually serve and run the airport vaccine center, serve and run the stadium uh, here, uh, uh, vaccine center, in, in, and, and help a lot of millions of population to get this. So this, this kind of shift done by nurses. Community engagement, our nurses, uh, that uh, the, the project led by Arij, is Arij here? Oh, give a big round of applause. Uh, Arij and home care, Shayma, 
Dr. Amirford, so what they done, they went to the orphan centers, orphan centers, and we, they said, well, we want to engage orphans, and, and we train them for something that can benefit them and take them away from what they do and feel. So they, they gave them four programs. They provide a, a program for a caregiver at home, program for caregiver at hospital, a, 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 a patient escort, and so on. So this kind and this program is running. Hopefully they're going to be graduated very soon. These orphans, they have no meaning of social life. And nurses, they step up and they engage to make this difference. Thank you, nurses. Ah, national nursing growth. We have a factory of nurses. Let us say, let thank God for this great bounty we have. Every year we're getting a group of nurses graduates. They do a numerous job, internship, and then we get them engaged, and we saw them. I remember early 2020, our rate, our our sodization percentage were about 4%. Just I heard from HR, they're speaking about 12%, just in one and a half year. That's a big shift. And uh, we, go, we go with the great job that's happened in terms of graduating them. So when they finish their graduation, they get ceremony, and then they engage in what we call transition to practice program. Where is Shaibi and her team? Please stand up, the professional development team. <laughs> professional development team. Ari, thank you very much for your great job. Thank you. So that's a product. So now we got the first batch of our transition to practice uh, program. They get graduated. And we are looking for the second batch to go in their engagement. And this was one of the greatest dairy, uh, objectives. Renal dialysis, you remember we were looking for renal dialysis nurses, but nurses, they said, no, we're going to make a program. They develop a program in collaboration with King Fahad Medical City, and we got the program. We got the first batch graduated, and now we have our enablers, renal dialysis. So we have certification of renal dialysis program. Collaboration and interdisciplinary team everywhere, and even we go beyond this, where we collaborate with other hospitals in local level, uh, even internationally. I got my mentor engage me with the Royal College of Surgeon, and uh, um, uh, so uh, we are flying with where we're supposed to go with the transformational leadership. Here also is the concept of leading by love. I go back to the heliotropic effect. In order to go and flourish, we need to keep healing environment. Healing cannot come without being just human in everything we do, in leadership, in communication, in everything we do, and that's what keeps us. So here's some of the momentums of the reflective sessions, of the programs, here are some of the flyers the team come up with, latte for instance, and uh, great, uh, greet, so that's one of the things that to help our nurses to deal with, with patients and communicate with, the, uh, with empathy and, and, and deal with the unhappy patients. Recognition and rewards, DAISY awards, shift the entire game. So we can see now everywhere nurses are getting acknowledged with this and this part of guys, your product. And the most important things, we do have a huge support from our president, uh, our president, Dr. Mazin Faqih, Allah Adil Afiyah. In every single, in every single, in every single um, activities, anything that matter for nursing, Dr. Mazin always there. Yes. And thank you very much. Today he's not with us, but Suleiman Faqih, Suleiman Mazin Faqih is here on behalf of him. So thank you very much. This number of acknowledgement and appreciation, I learned a lot in this organization. Thank you very much. Zero campaign, so we can see the results of ND in QI. We're going to see it in the end. Thank you very much, Sandra, Khadra, and every, every member working with Zero campaign. Big round of applause for them. They make huge shift. They make huge campaign. They engage nurses to go for zero campaign. Yes, we are not going to go zero, but we'll keep going zero. Please say thank you to Kathy for saying that we need just to continue work and go, don't stop. Excellence, excellence is not goal, excellence is journey, it's journey. 
Okay, so here we go, and Levin caught nursing education team. They shift the entire game. They said, we're going to get Levin caught technology, Levin caught software. It's becoming now all our competencies are Levin caught. Nurses are impressing this. They, they change the entire game. And now with this technology and millennials and Z generation, this becoming, mashallah, mia, mia. So thank you very much, nursing education team. They took us more. Uh, they gave us membership with, with different organizations to, to align our specialized nurses in every unit to get their, um, their alignment with internationally, attending conferences, getting resources. And this subscription, we got it fully supported by our president. And now I see every service line, they do have it. And they enjoy the momentum. They're getting these resources improved, helping them for their research and new knowledge. A N C C. We get the result. Very soon we're going to get the result. Thank you very much. We have Shaibi and their team. They went through this journey. They prepared the organization for ANCC. We had fantastic interview. They gave us the result, but they said we're going to send it officially, then we'll announce and celebrate. But let's celebrate now in our level. Thank you. Uh, huh? Where is Madame Bassant? Please, big round of applause to Madame Bassant. Without Madame Bassant, I don't know where we are now with ANCC. Shukran for this hadiyah, Doctor. Madame Basant is a great gift. Thank you very much. Um, and that also took us to look into the wound and pressure ulcer. I remember the time when I joined, I said, do we have wound management? They said, yes, we have somebody called Janet. Where is Janet? Please stand up. Ta'ali, 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 ta'ali. I need everybody to look at Janet. I'll tell you the story of Janet. Janet flipped the entire game of wound management. She was the only nurse, um, wound management nurse, and now how many we are? We have 28 successfully participating. 28 successfully participated in wound management. Course. Thank you very much. Janet went to Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. She got intensive training in wound management. She gets certified. And she retained back, and she left great legacy by building a capacity of wound management team. Many graduates, and now we are enjoying with the second batch. This is some of the momentums of the training. So instead of making wound management just only one specialized person run it, or two or three, but the entire team, that's our goal. So that's where we can shift and go where we want to be. Our college, they, alhamdulillah, with the support of Dr. Mazin, we got certification program, postgraduate nursing, um, uh, 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 postgraduate certification in specialization. And uh, at the starter, we announced we got 133 applicants, and then drop shoya, 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 shoya. And now, alhamdulillah, we are 100 shoya. So, uh, our aim for the next batch to go beyond certifications is matter and we can see the results in what we do every day. Um, Alhamdulillah, now BIXIS with the closed loop, I think we are 100% automated. Thank you nurses. Thank you pharmacy. Thank you laboratory and supply chain and everybody at Faqih Care. Thank you very much. Research and new knowledge. Just imagine, last year, 2020, we said, guys, part of our journey, we need to start for research. Every service line said, we're going to do it. I said, hey, COVID, we need to do education. We need to get training. They said, we'll do it. Now they are working on the publication phase and finalizing five research, almost. So, uh, and, and this in conjunction and collaboration with the college. So they get uh, well supervised by, um, by, by the college uh, uh, 
uh, professors and uh, associate professors with the great help by one of our stars called Anisa Hanif. Big plug. Where is Anisa? <laughs> Thank you, Anisa. And of course, different projects where we're going to see them now all in our um, uh, exhibition. And also tomorrow they will do presentations and also today. This is the accreditations I said. Imagine almost 10 accreditations, Sibahi for DCFH, Sibahi for ambulatory, GCA for, C for DCFH, GCA for ambulatory, GCA for home care, HIM 6, HIM 7, um, what we call baby friendly accreditation. They are working intensively for blend tree. What else? They are working for magnet. And what is more? Huh? Yes. Cup. Excellent. Where is laboratory cup? And, and, that's, and now they are working for baby friendly for cost and for ambulatory services. In 18 months, these great stars, they're going to conclude 12 accreditation. Amazing. Amazing, guys. MashaAllah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yes, this is the last. You can see here. This was the story. COVID-19 was where? Attack us somewhere here. Here, the pain of COVID-19. Here we got those elements and pain. But they decide to shift. We are now greens. In ND in QI, we're going green up to the quarter three, 2021. We are 92%. <laughs> Thank you, nurses. <laughs> amazing team. A really amazing team. So thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for listening. Not yes. me. Yes. That's okay. you. <laughs> okay, at this point, we would like to thank the presence of uh, Dr. Ziad Al Harbi, Academic and Training Affairs Director, <laughs> Doctor of the Medical Director of Pharmacy, Mr. Carter, our COO, Mr. Jeff Pharmacy. Dr. Mas Ma Mansour Memon, Director of Life Support Center, the man behind the proving clinical outcomes. Yes? You yes. had your BLS, your ACLS, your MRP, and all of that are supported and provided by the Life Support Center under the leadership of Dr. Mansour. Also, Mr. Panos, the group chief financial officer. Uh, I'm sorry, sir, I am not able to pronounce your full name, but uh, you are known to everybody as Mr. Panos. Thank you so much for your support to our uh, nurses' devotion. So, again, we're going to po pause for a while. We are going to have the opening of the exhibit area and the outdoor exhibit. We'll, we'll acknowledge and then we'll go for. We'll oh, before we will, uh, we will go to the. We will proceed to the opening of the uh, exhibit area. We would like to request uh, Mr. Sumanthani to be on the stage, please, and of course, Dr. Ziad. And Mr. Ahmed Hosami, our Chief Nursing Officer. We would like to call Ms. Professor Mustafa Bodik to receive a token of appreciation organizing committee of this event. Thank you. 
and a plaque of appreciation. Thank you so much. We also would like to request Dr. Kathy Ann Sinko to receive a token of appreciation for the organizing committee of the Racing Symposium 2021 and to receive a plaque of appreciation. We're not yet done. We're not, it's not yet over. Okay, Mr. Ahmed Hausawi to receive a uh, token of appreciation and a plaque of appreciation from the organizing committee of the fifth Pakistan Nursing Symposium. At this time, we would like to request again our guests, our keynote speakers, to have a group picture. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we would like to invite you all to the other hall uh, for the opening of the exhibits. Thank you, just for 10 minutes, please. Thank you.
Once again, good evening everyone. We shall now proceed to the presentation of the 2020 researchers. And uh, just to inform you that some of those researchers were completed and some are still ongoing. Our first presenter to present psychological impact of COVID-19 pandemic on Dr. Solomon Kaki Hospital nursing staff from Medical Surgical Service Line, Deborah Rose de Leon. So this one is working now? Okay. I don't have pocket. No, no, I need it. I need it. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, dear nurses and to our special guests. I am here, as Madam Sandra said, in behalf of the medical and surgical departments to present the research that, wa that was done back uh, 2020, on April, third week of 2020. This is entitled, Psychological Impact of COVID-19 Pandemic on Dr. Suleiman Faki Hospital Nursing Staff. So we all know that Hubei, China, introduced the new member of the Corona family way back in December 31st, 2019. And it shocked the whole world. Until today, COVID-19 has been progressing at a staggering rate. And it impacted people's lives until today we feel it. One of which, the new trends the new world that we are facing today, one of which the terminology that we usually say it, and these are the examples, social distance and flattening the curve. And we have to add an essential wardrobe in our daily activity, one of which is most or more precious than a Cartier, maybe, and this is the mask. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Also, COVID-19 impacted perceptions. Before, we'd love to be surrounded with positive people. But at this time, not yet. Now is not the right time to surround yourselves with positive people. Imagine yourselves a year ago. When you have plans to get married, get engaged, but with the presence of pandemic, COVID-19 says you cannot update your Facebook. Not even you cannot put in a relationship. You know why? Because you are in an isolation ship. Do you agree? Yes. So, as of December 10th, 2021, there have been 267 million 865 and 289 and more than 5.2 million reported deaths with the WHO. With that, starting May 17, 2020, July, and until today, there have been studies about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic in the mental stability of the healthcare workers. But our research, our research could have started in May 3rd of 2020. Now, 
With the COVID pandemic, it halted the whole world and metaphorically speaking, it stopped the earth from spinning. But the healthcare institutions, the healthcare workers did not stop at all. This pandemic demanded a complex human urgency, one of which our hospital catered as an auxiliary healthcare institution to governmental hospitals catering and providing support to patients with COVID-19, right? Now, <clears throat> this halted us to think, what about the nurses? Who cares for them? It's not an issue about how many COVID-19 patients we cared for. The issue is, what if you are a nurse continuously working and you are confined because you cannot go outboard of Saudi Arabia in Jeddah? So what about the nurses? And this halted us to investigate the psychological experience of the SFH nursing amid the global outbreak. We wanted to know the prevalence of the self-reported psychological state of the SFH nursing and way back in 2020, the current psychological well-being of the nurses. So we use a cross-sectional descriptive design in the SFH hospital and we have around 300 nurses as participants of this study, both inpatients and outpatients, whether or not they directly or indirectly cared for these COVID patients. And we use a predefined questionnaire, the DAS-21 and the IESR both of which are commendable questionnaires to assess the mental state of an individual. In the data collection, we obtained an approval from the IRB, and after that, we distributed these questionnaires. The participants filled out the consent forms, and the participation were voluntary, we maintain privacy and anonymity, and the results are presented either in pie or bar graph. Look at the results. Out of 300 nurses, 201 did not have depression. Mild, 39, moderate, 33, severe, depression, 18, and extremely depressed, nine. Anxiety. Out of 300 nurses, 144 nurses have not experienced or were not anxious about the pandemic, while 33 nurses experience mild anxiety, 54 moderate, 24 severe, and 45 were extremely anxious. For the stress, 219 out of 300, mashallah, even if in isolation ship, they're not stressed. They remain single till now, I bet. <laughs> 33 nurses, however, experienced stress, 24 moderate, 18 severe, and six were extremely stressed. For I IESR, this will not or this study or questionnaire cannot be used as a diagnosis or medical diagnosis for all the participants. This will just give you an outlook how these nurses would have the possibility to develop later on a post-traumatic stress disorder. 45% out of 300 nurses will not ever experience PTSD, while some 72 nurses can partial PTSD, probable PTSD 18, 
and 75 experience symptoms that are high enough to suppress immunity. We discussed, and in conclusion, this data narrates that majority of the nurses remain psychologically healthy. Woo! Shout out to our nurses! And may I borrow one slide from Professor Baudry a while ago. You never knew the power that you dreamed of. You have it. And what is that? Resilience. This is a characteristic that helped the nurses to be better cope in crisis and function more effectively and work in the workplace. Who knows? No one knows, even me, until this study came up. Nurses must have strong connections to make resilience as more contagious than the virus. Staying connected, connected and checking on those you care is one way to facilitate individual strength. As a recommendation, we cannot, we cannot just take our back, go and, okay, majority nurses are okay. We have the vulnerable group, right? We have to monitor and evaluate as a recommendation, and we need to have to give them psychological support interventions. Nurses who have surpassed the resilience threshold, we need to have a reactive strategy. And these strategies are not one size fits all. It needs to be individualized. For the low risk group, we have to focus on support and maintaining psychological well-being and coping in terms of communication skills. So, thank you, and more power to our nurses. Thank you, Deborah, for that uh, wonderful presentation. So, our nurses are safe, right? <laughs> to present assessing the impact of nursing staff engagement and empowerment towards workplace, shared governance, and decision making. From professional and practice development, let's all welcome Alisa Halifa. Thank you, Mom. Good evening to all. Good evening to all. I am Anisa Hanifa, nursing educator from Nursing Continuous Professional Development. Here is my team members. I am going to discuss about our research regarding impact of nursing staff's engagement and empowerment on workplace shared governance in the organizational decision making outcomes. As we all know that an inadequate feeling of empowerment creates an adverse impact on patients, nurses and quality of healthcare. Nurses who feel a substantial amount of exasperation in their work is tends to resign from the job. So in order to avoid such negative impression, one of the key strategies we used here it is implementation of shared governance model. What is shared governance? It's a practice model that empowers the nurses or the staff closest to the bedside. Also, it guides the organizational nursing care delivery and professional development. Compared to the traditional healthcare, today's healthcare is more complex, right? Also, it leads to some issues like lack of nurses, reduced workforce, and higher patient activities. 
and it triggers there is increases in nurses workload sleep deprivation and work discontentment to achieve such professional goal and governance nurses have started participated in many committees by developing or implementing this shared governance it's creating a collaborative relationship between healthcare professionals also increasing the quality of outcome staff confidence level their decision making skill and professional accountability so here in order to know about our nurses opinion regarding shared governance implementation we conducted a monkey survey during april 2020 the result shows here that there are 33 percentage of the nurses are strongly agreed for the shared governance implementation then we implemented it so our purpose of research, the purpose of our research is to assess the impact of shared governance implementation also what recommendations will be made to the shared governance for continuous quality improvement regarding research methodology the design what we used here is it's a quantitative study utilized cross sectional research design regarding sampling technique we used purposive sampling sample size we selected 200 nurses the settings of our study is faki care it includes dr suleiman faki hospital dr suleiman faki medical center faki medical home both in nuzha and altogar executive clinic and home health care the tool we used here it is ipng that is index of professional nursing governance the tool developed by dr robert has we got official permission from dr robert has foundation as well we analyzed the data with the help of spss that is statistical package for social sciences regarding the participants criteria for selection the nurses who finished their probationary period and those who are currently working in faki also they able to read write and speak english and those who have the license to practice do their job in saudi arabia then we excluded the nurses those who are in the administrative level also the interns also we excluded and there is no any penalties for the staff those who did not participate in the study also there is no any incentives we offer those who participated in the study as well regarding data collection after we get a formal written permission from the institutional review board we visited each unit in the hospital we explained them regarding the purpose of the study sometimes we unable to find the participants because of their work demands some of them they hesitant to participate in the study they are thinking maybe it will affect their work even though we able to explain them regarding the purpose of the study and we gave them one month time period after two weeks we gave them reminder through hospital email system after we get all the data collected we analyze it with the help of spss and let's go for the result demographic characteristics of the respondents out of 200 nurses based on their gender there were 182 females and 18 male based on their education one hold associate degree 18 nurses are diploma and 181 hold bsn degree based on their educate experience you can see here out of 200 nurses it's more goes to 75 nurses those who are in the period of 4 to 6 years of experience in faki care regarding the mean of governance per specialty out of six service lines 
except one service line or other service lines where their governance was shared. I want to include here that this study we did during the early stage of shared governance implementation. I am sure now there is no any traditional governance exist. So all the units under the nursing department sharing in many aspects in terms of governance and decision making to resolve and addressing the concerns and issues regarding to nursing governance. In order to provide more support to the shared governance, organization must continuously assess and evaluate the tool as well. This will enhance the staff's leadership ability and professional accountability. Let me conclude here that all the, all the uh, overall governance in all the Faki care is still uh, there is shared but some areas still under traditional governance. So in order to achieve the whole compliance we need to involve every nurses in the Faki care in all the unit. Shared governance bring the voice of bedside nurses. It's create a healthy work environment as well. Here we can recommend that identifying and recognizing the traditional areas and also we need to develop an action plan for that areas to make it as more strength of the organization. So as part of our research action plan we revised our unit based councils. Before our unit based councils based on service lines. Here is our new revised unit based councils. It based on each unit. In order to reach out to every single nurse in the organization. That's all about our research outcome. Thank you all. Thank you, Anissa. I'm sure that uh, when we restructuring of the unit-based council, uh, shared governance will be improved. Actually, the results are very good, right? Yes. Okay. To present factors influencing patient satisfaction on the rendered services and the outpatient department of Dr. Solomon the Hospital. From the outpatient department service line, please welcome Laura May Gobuka. Good evening everyone. Good evening everyone. I'm Lara Megumugda from Outpatient Department and I'm going to present to you our research study titled Factors Influencing Patient Satisfaction on the Rendered Service in the Outpatient Departments of Dr. Suleiman Fakir Hospital. Patients are the key elements in healthcare, and it is extremely crucial to increase their satisfaction level. For healthcare providers and researchers alike, patient satisfaction is a subject of great interest, especially in the outpatient department where old and new patients are seeking for medical advice. Since competition has increased in recent years, this exerts more pressure on the healthcare providers to render more high service quality to satisfy their patient. Um, in previous studies have shown that patient satisfaction includes many contents and there are many influencing factors. The sub-aspects of patient satisfaction include the visiting environment, medical expenses, service attitude, medical technology, and medical facilities. 
For instance, for instance, Meng in 2018 found that the affecting factors of patient satisfaction for most to least were patient, uh, physician patient relationship and communication, service organization and facilities, continuity of collaboration of medical care, and access to relevant information and support. In all over healthcare, quality is the cornerstone that differentiates between good and bad patient satisfaction result. Patient satisfaction is an important index of healthcare quality and it is frequently used in planning and evaluation of healthcare service. The purpose or aim of this study is to assess the factors influencing patient satisfaction on the rendered service in outpatient department of Dr. Saliman Fakhi Hospitals and to find ways to improve patient satisfaction in all areas of outpatient department. Methodology. A cross-sectional study was utilized in the current study to assess the factors influencing patient satisfaction. Um, a convenient sampling of technique was utilized in selecting 450 patients attending consultation in the three outpatient uh, units of the hospitals. Inclusion criteria of the participants are 18 years old and older, with or without insurance, and patients who are willing for the study. Excluded from this study are patients who refuse participation, patients below 18 years old, and patients with special needs. Uh, prior to data collection, a formal written permission letter was submitted to IRB. Participation was voluntary and they are free to withdraw any time, without giving reason. Result of this study will be shared only if the participants agreed to do so. The patients were given information about the purpose, possible benefits, and anonymity of the study. Before involvement of each participant was asked to write an informed consent. The overall means of patient satisfaction in OPD-1 has a mean of 4.33 with a standard deviation of 0.66. OPD-2 has a mean of 4.07 with a standard deviation of 0.75. And OPD-7 has a mean of 4.3 with a standard deviation of 0.65. In this table, you will see the demographic characteristics of the study participants. The majority for age would be 31 to 40 years old with 27.3%. Gender would be male with 258.9%. Uh, Education level, the majority would be high school graduate and type of visit would be follow-up cases. And this table also shows the patient satisfaction in the three OPD units. This is um, subsections of appointment process, the registration, waiting area and waiting time, communication, visit with our providers, our doctors, our nurses, and our facility and services. To further discuss the results, OPD-1 has a low satisfaction rate in communication with a mean of 3.84. This includes patients, phone calls are answered promptly, getting advice or help when needed during office hours, and our effectiveness of our health information materials. And congratulations, nurses, patients were more satisfied with regards to the service we are providing. Nurses' positive attitude, respect patient privacy, and their ability to make patient comfortable was the highest rate of patient satisfaction. <laughs> For OPD2, registration process has a low mean with 3.55 compared to OPD1 and OPD7. Registration process, this includes that registration staff warmly welcomes the patients. They were punctual and reachable, waiting time in the registration process is appropriate, and ease of registration process. This suggests that the need to identify the inefficiencies in registration. Facility and services of OPD2 got the highest satisfaction rate with a mean of 4.73. 
This includes the hours of our hospital operation, overall comfort, the adequate parking, signage, and direction. For OPD Building 7, congratulations again, nurses. You, had, you got the highest score, which is 4.76. This indicates that the relationship between nursing, caring nursing, and patient satisfaction is a very important factor in evaluating the quality of care performed by nurses. And communication got the lowest score of 3.69. The conducted analysis proved that the majority of the patients are very satisfied with the courtesy and kindness of our doctors, the condition of cleanliness and neatness of our waiting areas, receive a high score for patients from OPD-1 and OPD-7, and the hospital service and facility received the highest score from patients of all OPD units. In conclusion, patient satisfaction with medical services provided by Dr. Suleiman Fakhi Hospital is generally high. The study concludes that communication, registration process, waiting time and area are the concerns in the service rendered in OPD department. Uh, our recommendation is suggest that interventions to improve patient satisfaction should pay attention to improving communication, registration process, and waiting time. Before I end this uh, presentation, I just want to tell you that patient satisfaction is an attitude. Though it does not ensure that the patient will remain loyal to the hospital, it is still a motivating factor. We nurses should provide patient-focused care in a particular way. Not just sometimes or usually, but always. We should provide care in every patient, every time. Thank you. Thank you, Mara, for that presentation. A very important uh, uh, research. Because I think well patient satisfaction is one of the uh, highest strategic priorities of our organization. To present communication barrier and level of clinical nursing expertise of nurses in Dr. Solomon Fakir Hospital, from Maternal and Child Health Service Line, please welcome Pauline Powell. Good evening. Are you still awake? Don't worry if Mr. Ahmad said earlier that he will deliver a very, very, very light message. I will deliver a very, very less uh, power uh, presentation. So uh, let me introduce to you uh, the member of our UBC um, New Knowledge and Research team for the year 2020. Uh, Christine Joy, Carla, Jillian, Maria Aurora, Lean, and most of them are here to join and to support us tonight. So, so if you have noticed in our early uh, earlier with uh, the, the some research of our fellow um, colleagues here, they talk about the importance of communication and how it affects the patient satisfaction. I know that this research regarding communication barrier is, for some, maybe it's just simple research. But let us acknowledge the need to know if we really have, until now, until this time, communication barrier. Because communication or effective communication is an essential factor for us to deliver a safe and quality patient care up to this time. So let me start. Communication is a core element of healthcare activities in healthcare settings. All nursing activities such as assessment, planning, intervention, evaluation, health teaching, encouragement, counseling, and caring can never be achieved without effective communication. 
just imagine yourself talking to a patient wherein she doesn't understand what you are trying to tell her. Or a nurse, a new nurse who is trying to talk to the patient and assessing her. The nurse doesn't have idea about what the patient is trying to tell her. Can you imagine this impact on patient safety? I'm sure most of our nurses here can relate to this, especially when we are starting our career here. Right? Right? Thank you. So communication barrier, effective communication is key when providing quality health care. The dynamics of communication within the healthcare team and with the patient and family can be challenging. This is according to Tootle, Little, and Ledford in 2019. And effective communication is understood by both person. It means the receiver and the giver, or the giver and the receiver. The purpose of this research is to find evidences that will conclude that there is existing problem between patients and nurses' interaction regardless of nurses' level of expertise or the length of their stay in the kingdom, specifically the level of clinical expertise in our hospital. What are the communication barriers identified by our nurses in our hospital and to identify if there is significant relationship in the level of clinical nursing expertise and communication barriers of nurses in the SFH. So we use a descriptive survey method and uh, to determine the communication barriers and clinical nursing expertise. This study was con conducted uh, to 301 nurses in different capacities in inpatient wards. So subjects in the population are sampled by random process using either a random number or drawing of lots and so each person remaining in the population has the same probability of being selected for the sample. For the data collection and analysis, the sample size was calculated according to the number of nurses in the ward and the researchers, uh, researchers during the, 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 uh, the data collection, they encountered difficulties and some staff were not present since we are usually that time during pandemic and most of our staff are engaged with the patients and if not, they are taking their full day off. A written consent was attached as first page for each questionnaire and the respondents uh, are protected from the uh, protected, uh, their identity are protected in order uh, for them to answer the, the, the questionnaire um, and we ready to withdraw at any time. The data were corrected by, by visualizing, calculating frequencies and sorting and the analysis was done with descriptive statistics by using frequency, percentage, mean, median and standard deviation. The analysis between dependent and independent variables was performed using Pearson's and analysis of variance or ANOVA. And results were represent, or presented in text, tables, charts, and graphs. So majority of our, um, these are the demographic characteristics of our study, which I will not reiterate because it's in our tables. So for the ethnicity, most of our respondents are Asian, which uh, uh, we are having 81.7%. Next is our, the Arab nationals, which uh, consist of uh, com uh, com um, compromise of 10.3%. Uh, and then the American and Indian native, which is 4.7%. And the uh, Caucasian, which is, which is 2%, and African, which is 1.3%. And uh, we have 10 years above, which garners 27.2%, and uh, 2 to 4 years, which is 31 to 9%, which means most of our staff here are, sorry to say, excuse me. Mam Sholly, old. 
I'm really sorry. Shabab. <laughs> Our millennials. Okay. So, so these are the words where we collected our data. And these are the clinical nursing expertise. We have proficient nurses, which is 39.2%, competent nurses, which are 38.5%, advanced beginner, which is 13%, and expert, which is 5%, and very new or novice, 4.3%. So as a result, significant relationship among clinical nursing expertise, communication, patients, and environmental barriers were observed in this study. This means that the clinical nursing experience and different factors of barriers affects vice versa. Patient barriers, negative attitude of the patient towards the nurse, presence of patient's companions at the patient bedside, and lack of cooperation were the most important nurse-to-patient communication barrier. Do you agree with this? Do you agree with this? This is the reason why we always have complaints which we usually um, uh, face, right? But we always, through communication, fix the problem be be uh, before it uh, affects everybody. So, on the other hand, inappropriate environmental condition and the busy environment of the ward is a factor as well. This implies that unsafe caring environments are among the obstacles to nurse-to-patient communication. An attractive healthcare environment can hinder the interaction between nurses and patients. Further, a busy environment or the crowdedness of the healthcare environment is, uh, can inhibit nurse-to-patient communication. So in conclusion, the first step in resolving nursing issues such as cultural issue is to understand that barriers and limitation of compassionate care. As a result, action should be taken to remove current barriers and increase the facility required by nursing practitioners in order to provide compassionate care. Nurses' emotional, physical, and mental needs must all be considered, and it is also necessary to adhere to society's religious and cultural values when caring for our patient. So our recommendation, these barriers must be addressed from the viewpoint of other members of the medical profession as well as patient. It is also a good idea to look into the communication gaps between healthcare professionals. From the nurse's perspective, the most significant barriers to nurse-patient communication were a lack of time, heavy workload during shift, and a shortage of nursing staff. Providing care by native and same-gender nurses decreases the involvement and presence of patients' companions Providing a calm environment and increasing proportion of nursing staff may indeed help to overcome these challenges. And that's all. Thank you. As promised. Thank you, Colleen. We would like to uh, ask Professor Pascal to give us a small, uh, a short message. Absolutely short. Salam alaikum. I, first of all, uh, I would like to say
especially to our honorary guests, colleagues, friends. Good evening. Um, my name is Ronami Palomo. I'm one of the members of the UBC from the Ambulatory Medical Services. And I'm tasked to present this research entitled Saudi Community's Perception Towards Community Health Nursing. It's kind of a broad topic, I know. <laughs> yes. So what is Community Health Nursing? Community health nursing is composed of nursing practice and public health practice obtained to promote and maintain the health of populations. Moreover, it is a specialized field of nursing that focuses the health uh, needs of communities, aggregates, and in particularly vulnerable populations. So it combines all the basic elements and tools of professional, clinical nursing, and public health practice. For background, health and care systems worldwide are facing a huge pressures of increasing needs from an aging population. That's why some of the nurses abroad are being are preferred to work in home health care, such as in UK, even here in Saudi Arabia, and limited financial resources. In several countries, the community care sector, and in particular, nurses play a key role in managing care for older people with chronic conditions at home, thereby reducing pressures on secondary care services. That's why most of our patients prefer to finish their antibiotic therapy at home. So, that's, so that is to lessen their expenses, of course. Success in reducing the risk and improving the health of the community depends on the involvement of the consumers, especially groups experiencing health risks and others in the community, in health planning and in self-help activities. So for the aim of this study, uh, we uh, asked to assess the level of comprehension, awareness and understanding of Saudi community towards community health nursing among Faki Care Medical Sciences nursing students' family. Second is to assess the attitude and beliefs of Saudi community towards female and male nurses catering patients of the opposite sex. For the methodology, we use a descriptive exploratory design that enables the investigator to collect the data and perform quantitative analysis in order to determine the perception of Saudi community, specifically the families of the Faki Care Medical Sciences nurses. For the setting, it, uh, the data was uh, collected here in Jeddah, city of Saudi Arabia. So the sample were mainly the parents of 200, and 200 undergraduate students taking up nursing at Faki College. And excluded are those uh, families that are outside of Jeddah. So for the research tool, uh, Actually, frankly, we have a hard time looking for questionnaires, tools in websites, articles. So we opted to use a self-made questionnaire. With the go signal of our nursing director, Ms. Nujud, we are about to finish this work. And uh, thank, um, we're also thankful for Dr. Safa from Safa Turkistani from the director of research in Faki Care, uh, Faki College of Medical Sciences for being able to critique our questionnaire and 
This wouldn't be possible without her advices and counsels. So uh, uh, the research was uh, the research tool was uh, divided into three parts. First, the demographic data. Second is the yes or no questions, which aims to answer the first aim of the study, which is the comprehension, understanding, and analysis of the, faki, uh, the family of the faki care students. Second part is the light curve scale, which uh, answers the second uh, aim of the study to assess their attitude and beliefs. So for the result, the questionnaires were coded uh, via the social sciences SPSS version. The description of the data will be done in form of mean standard deviation, frequency, and proportion that is used for the quantitative data. So for the discussion, analysis of the correlations between and among the variables of this study and the sets of literature gathered will be interpreted introspectively. So as of now, we are having an ongoing statistical analysis. And after that, once it's completed, we will interpret it based on the literature that was uh, utilized during the proposal. And as for the conclusion, based uh, the conclusion will be extracted from the result analysis and will be evaluated as to its contributions in the field of identifying the level of awareness and perception of Saudi community regarding Saudi nurses towards community health nursing. This section will elaborate as to how the results of the research would be significant contributions in the development of new knowledge in the field of community health nursing. So as for the recommendations, the result of the study will serve as a basis of other future research touching community health nursing and recommend spe specific progresses in the conduct of said research based on the limitations encountered by the study. And uh, for us, actually, the purpose of making this study was uh, we, are, we want this to be used as one of the literature as to how prepared the Saudi is for the 2030 vision. That's it. Thank you so much, guys, for listening, and have a blessed day ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rona. We would like to request Professor Ahmed Al-Sawi and Dr. Mansour Bemon to present the plaque of appreciation to all our presenters. Remember that our nursing symposium is for two days. This is the day one. And tomorrow, we still have the day two at Dr. Solomon Fakir Hospital, 7th floor. It will start at 9 o'clock in the morning. Well, uh, I just uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank the, uh, the visitors and those who contributed in this active five research. It was not an easy time, uh, yet you made it and you worked hard to achieve this moment. Uh, this is not the stop point, but it is the beginning where we're going to articulate these results and convert it into an action plan and also align it with what we do in our events, looking for instance some of the recommendations in regards to the communication barriers as an example. So what we can do different and we can put it as a recommendation, how we can reflect on the existing activities which can improve this over time. This is goals of every single research. I think this is the beauty of research and new knowledge as a major component of management uh, in others. So thank you very much. Really, really thank you very much. Thank you. Our first speaker to receive the appreciation, Colleen Pogoy. The mayor of Medellin. Next is Deborah Rose de Leon. Our 
professor before. <laughs> Since I know you, I'm calling you the prof. Prof without the training. No, she is. Yeah. Rona May Palomo. Lara May Gomuda. Anissa Hanifa. Okay. Sama Soleiman. She will be presenting tomorrow, maintaining skin to skin practice per WHO recommendation. Giselle Castro Nuevo. I'm going to present more of the cell. I'm going to present more. Yeah, that's true. Yes, that's true. Maria Corazon Yero. Coral will be presenting improving patient outcomes using lip and cord competencies. Shaimi Joseph. The hidden soldier. Rima Philip. Sandra, you are real master of ceremony. Mashallah. The way you pronounce the name. Very professional. Very professional. Maika Estabilio. Joseas Senangote. Rosemary Ian. Derisa Reynaldo. Shoni Kavuma. Mama Shoni. Well done, Shoni. Sherilyn Gamboa. Basam Jamil. Janet Kacho. And 
Galib Fahmi Salim. At this point, we would like to invite everyone to please attend the day two of the fifth Faki Care Nursing Symposium at Dr. Suleiman Faki Hospital, seventh floor, building two. Wait a minute, please. Huh? Wait a minute. I have one more presentation because one of our speakers she stepped her name in the delivery of the wow. Sandra. Ha, ha, ha. 